Hi, and welcome to a conference room. Oftentimes I find myself in a conference room where I'm presenting research findings to clients, trying to help them with their marketing situations. It's a lot of fun. Sometimes there's ethical dilemmas. When I'm in a conference room working with customers and clients, I'm Mike Weiss. Today we're going to focus on the idea of ethical du duty. Hosmer Chapter 4 presents the ethical duty con contention. Yes, economic analysis is important and it's helpful. Yes, legal analysis is important and helpful. But sometimes ethical duties is really what it stands on. It's not a matter of what's profitable or what's legal. It comes down to normative philosophy for myself. What ought I to do? What is the best practice? What is the right thing to do? And so the ethical duty contention is that normative philosophy, bringing ourselves to the table to make decisions that are congruent with who we are and what we want to become is absolutely imperative. So the best ethical decision is based upon ethical duties informed by our personal and our organizational values, and they emanate from the core character of the persons involved. The book talks about uh, this not being new. Uh, the idea of personal virtue dates all the way back to Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. The idea of the good society and what it means to be a contributor to the good life. Their idea was that as a human being, we need to be honest, we need to be truthful, we need to be moderate, and we need to have pride in ourselves. That these virtues need to be characteristic of who we are, and that we'll be judged by others as to whether or not we live by these personal virtues. In today's language, it's when you are disclosed for who you really are, are you proud of it? If something you did found its way in the news, would it be something that is to be applauded or something that is appalled? What's the personal virtue and is there congruency between your articulation of who you are and the reality of who you are? I know a person in my personal life that um, he was known to be respectful. He climbed the organizational chart, was known in the community through social uh, activity, highly respected. But he was tempted in the workplace. And he started to take a little bit of money because he thought it was due that little bit of money. And that little bit of money became a lot of money over time. And when the auditors found out what he was doing, it became headline news. All of a sudden, his personal virtue was undermined. He was disrespected. In this case, his activities were illegal. He spent time in prison. He had to reconstruct himself. He had to go through a process of, of redemption and of reconciliation. And thankfully, at this point in his life, he's a very different person. There's great congruence between his articulation of self and his reality of self. That wasn't always true. He did not live to the personal virtues that he espoused. He did not contribute to a good society. He did not live a good life. Now, through much suffering, that's tr not true. He is contributing to the good society. He is living a good life. Which brings up the idea of personal values. Personal values suggest that deep down inside of us, there's kind of a measuring stick. There's there's a sense of what we really hold to be true and what we really value. In chapter number one of Hosmer, he articulates that we need to identify our personal beliefs and the norms and the uh, goals and also the values that are driving our decisions. And that there's going to be conflict sometimes between the beliefs, norms, goals, and values of other people. So recognizing our own personal values is, is a good exercise. And I've listed a whole bunch of possible personal values. 
And it's been interesting in my own personal life to discover what I really stand for. I can say I stand for certain things, but when a crisis emerges, when I'm confronted in the conference room with a decision that is an ethical imperative, and there's temptation involved, and there's gain to be had, there's loss to be um, taken away from there. There's, ah, uh, there's, what am I going to do? And in that moment, sometimes when I'm confronted with that parable, the sad do moment that we discussed before, huh, I can make a choice that's not in alignment with my personal values. And so understanding my personal values and being in those positions where I can live by those personal values is part of being a person of virtue. Those personal values might also be informative as you're making your decision on your ethical, personal ethical dilemma paper, and also as you're making an executive decision on your stand your ground paper. So consider your personal values. Now, Hosmer articulates some historically used tools or ways of making ethical duty decisions. And one that's very common in the business world is the idea of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism makes sense for business people because we like cost-benefit analysis. We like looking at a decision and measuring the specific costs of implementing it and the benefits of implementing it. We've developed financial tools like capital budgeting, net present value, entire rate of return, where we're, we're trying to measure whether or not this decision is going to financially produce the result we want. And so we're doing economic analysis, which we've already discussed. Uh, utilitarian analysis, though, extends beyond just the dollars and cents to what are the sum benefits and the sum costs of a particular decision. So if I'm an executive and I'm trying to decide if I'm going to grow my business in a local community, well, maybe the cost structures are higher or move it to where labor price costs are lower, uh, I'm, I've got an ethical dilemma. And I'm going to have to measure those who are benefited and those who have costs and what's the number of people that have benefit and what's the magnitude of their benefit and what's the number of people who have costs and what's the magnitude of their costs and the cost might be dollars and cents but also might extend to to life issues and so i'm going to look at the sum total on society of costs and benefits and then i'm going to make a decision are the Benefits outweighing the costs. And the decision-making rule is, what's the greatest good for the greatest number? And so I'll make a decision recognizing that there's going to be some harm, that there'll be people hurt. But what's the greatest good for the greatest number? And that outcome is the basis of my decision. I'm going to focus on the outcome. But maybe you think to yourself, ah, it's not always about the outcome. Sometimes it's about people's rights. It's about the process. It's about making sure that people are not harmed in the process. It's the way we do it, not necessarily just the outcome. Well, that be a universalism position, that the decision criteria is whether or not an action in question will violate an individual or a group's rights, that there are rights that are inherently part of human existence. And because we are human, we have rights that should not be infringed upon. Here in the United States, uh, our Constitution is built upon the Bill of Rights, where we try to state up front what are the rights that are inherent in the existence of human beings who live in the United States of America. Uh, other individuals like uh, uh, Kant, Immanuel Kant, have come up with some decision-making rules. Uh, based upon universalism. Uh, and one of them is called the categorical imperative, that I should never act except in such a way that I can also will that my maxim should become a universal law. In other words, I should not act in a way that if everybody followed my pattern, I would create a society that is negative, that is contradictory from what I want. I should act in a way that it become a maxim for universal ways of behaving. Another way of looking at this is I should never use individuals, human beings, as just a means to my end, that Machiavellian perspective that everybody and everything should be used in a way that brings me the benefit that um, whatever happens, that's the way it is, if it produces the result I want. No, categorical imperative 
imperative would say, according to Immanuel Kant, uh-uh, I need to act as if human beings are important as an end in themselves, not just as a mean, a tool to get what I want. And so the idea of legal and moral rights is one that made you say, hey, it's important that we withhold or uphold, that's the right word, uphold these rights. We do not want to withhold these rights. We want to uphold these rights. And some individuals go as far as to say that there is a, a preeminent right, and that right is of justice. That what we need to do is make sure that things are fair and equitable, that there's not injustice that's being done. And so justice is concerned with the comparative treatment given to the members of a group when benefits and burdens are distributed, when rules or laws are administered, when members of a group cooperate or compete, and when people are punished for the wrongs they have done or compensated for the wrongs they're suffered, according to John Rawls. And so according to this universal principle, justice is what needs to be upheld. So when there's a conflict, what is the just thing to do? And the book talks about three forms of justice, distributive justice, how fairly are benefits and burdens distributed, retributive justice concerns the fairness for, with which rule breakers are identified, the sanctions are applied in the process for which these sanctions are applied. Our criminal justice system has rules that tries to make sure that justice is being done in the process of determining whether somebody is, is guilty or not. And compensatory justice, if something happens uh, that has created harm, if a company is making a product that is not safe and individuals are harmed because of the use of that product, pro product, then what's their compensation? And so in the American system, we have the idea of distributive, retributive, and compensatory justice. Others individuals will say, uh, it's not just a matter of justice, it's a matter of liberty. That ultimately human beings should have freedom and that freedom gives individuals the choice as to what they're going to do. As long as they're not hurting other people, freedom should be the ultimate criteria, liberty. And we have a political party called the Libertarians that hold to that particular view. And so thus far, we've had various views of, of viewing uh, a normative philosophy or ethical duties, utilitarianism, rights, justice, liberty. Another idea that the book talks about is um, really kind of a worldview. Do you have a worldview that suggests that everything is relative? Um, it all depends. The situation will dictate what's right or wrong. That moral standards are situational. They're cultural. They do not necessarily provide guidance in different situations or different cultures. That there's nothing universal, or there's nothing eternal, or there's nothing that gives a consistent precept that you, in your situation, may have to determine what's appropriate. The whole idea there is of relativism. Or do you hold to more of an eternal law perspective? Eternal law, according to Hosmer, would suggest that, that a deity, that God, has created a sense of order, and that that order is preordained, and it is consistently applied. And as a result, it transcends situations, it transcends culture, and that there are rules or guidances that we should all follow, irregardless of the situation. If we're in a situation where maybe it'd be advantageous for us to lie, but there is an eternal law that suggests that lying is wrong, it's a sin, then what are we going to do? Are we going to lie because that situation um, provides a justification for lying, or are we going to hold to an eternal law that says no lying is wrong, therefore I cannot do it. 
And so there's this juxtaposition between the idea of relativism and the idea of eternal law. And then the book talks about kind of the advantages and disadvantages of both perspectives. And it also shares that this idea of eternal law is not obviously just a Christian perspective and that the idea of, of the golden rule, which sounds a lot like the categorical imperative, the idea that you will do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is an idea that is found in Judaism and in Islam and is in Hinduism. And it's not necessarily just a Christian idea, the idea that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto you. So that's something to consider. Do you see the world as relative or do you see the world as governed by eternal law? Now, for me personally, um, now these are tough decisions, and, and, and it's not always black and white. And there's not obviously, in my experience, uh, the you can and you can't, and it's just very clear. And, and that provides some challenges for me as a follower of Jesus Christ. And a book that has been helpful for me personally is one by a friend of mine. His name is Alexander Hill. Alec Hill. He's a he's actually CEO of of InterVarsity, former professor at uh, Seattle Pacific University, and this book is called Just Business, Christian Ethics for the Marketplace. And I highly recommend it to you. This is a book that's been informative in my life as I've worked with, oh my land, um, probably, let's count maybe 26 different Christian groups uh, with different theologies and different perspectives on the Bible and uh, obviously different ideas about social justice and, and about economic justice and about war and about life. And oh man, it just gets really confusing because all these people who are followers of Jesus Christ have different views. And, and so I've had to wrestle with my own perspectives as a person who's come from um, more of a Wesleyan Arminian, consistent with the theological views of the Church of the Nazarene. And so uh, where do I, as a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, fall on these things? And, and for me personally, this book has been helpful as I thought about the character of God and what are the, the, the characteristics of God that transcend any particular scripture that is an overview of the character of God that is found in Old Testament and New Testament that is seen in the life of, of the early um, of Moses and of Joseph and, and found in the life of David and found in the life of the prophets and found in the life most certainly of Jesus Christ and of the apostles and of the followers of Jesus um, in the church. What are those universal principles that seem to capture the character of God. And, and there are three that I think are pretty informative as I'm trying to live out these precepts in my own personal life. And, and one is the idea of holiness, that there are some standards, that there are, uh, that God is a God of holiness and is calling upon us to do right and to do good. And that there are some times when self-interest and selfishness and the sin nature calls upon activities that are incongruent with a holy God. That I should not be a person who lies. I should not be a person who covets and desires other people and other people's property. I should not be a person who steals. I should not be a murderous person. Uh, there, are, there are some principles of holiness that ultimately Jesus says that I should love God and love others. Therefore, holiness leads to the second characteristic of God, and that is love. And so what does my concept of trying to live according to the love of Jesus Christ call me to do? Does that mean that uh, I can live selfishly, that I can live only for my own ends? Do I need to consider the perspective of others and what would be the thing that, that Jesus would say a loving person who's trying to emulate him would do? And so love, which in, in, in uh, some of the, the scriptural works suge is suggested as the ultimate guidance, what would love suggest? And then the idea of justice, the idea that God does not find fulfillment or find consistent with his character, the idea that people will be taken advantage of, that people will be abused, that people will be um, treated as inhumane because they don't have the status or they do not have the economic resources or they do not have the uh, networks that allow them to have um, an opportunity 
for success. And so um, sometimes I have to wrestle with the idea of justice, especially as a person who, frankly, has been um, given great privilege in our society. Uh, what is the just thing to do? So this is not always easy or clear to me, but I try, as I'm dealing with ethical dilemmas, to consider what is the holy thing to do, what is the loving thing to do, what is the just thing to do. As a follower of Jesus, I want to try to emulate a life that is consistent with the character of God, the character of God as um, indicated through his son, Jesus Christ. And so uh, this is something that I'm trying to, to, to wrestle with, and I don't have easy answers for always. But as you look at the uh, resolution that I have for my ethical dilemma, I hope that you see that these principles are, uh, are being played out and they're informing the decision I'm going to make as to whether or not I'm going to share a link with my students that gives them access to a book resource outside the bookstore. All right? Ethical duty, normative philosophy. Yes, economics help. Yes, legal analysis helps. But we need to add that third dimension, the idea of normative philosophy, the ethical duties that come from who we are and how that informs the decisions we'll make and the implication those decisions will have on others. All right? Have a great day.